Well, one of the important distinctions that needs to be made both in research and in discussions that parents have because it is one that really can change the behavior of people it has to do with defining and getting it right what co-sleeping means versus what bed sharing means versus what sofa sharing means. Co-sleeping is referring to any situation in which a mother and baby or a father and baby or a committed caregiver and a baby are within sensory range of each other, can detect each other in terms of seeing and hearing and feeling and perhaps even smelling, so that the, each of the participants can detect and respond to those signals and cues of the other, because it changes for the baby, the baby's physiology in very, very important ways. There are as many ways to co-sleep with your baby as there are cultures doing it, thousands of different ways depending upon where you are. In our culture, one way would be to have your baby in bed with you, called bed sharing. Another way to do it would be to have your baby sleeping alongside in a bassinet within arm's reach, you know, or in a pack and play. Um, the Navajo Indians put a baby on a cradle board and lean the cradle board right next to a modern bed. That's their way of co-sleeping. Um, some moms around the world sleep on a hammock with their baby. Some, you know, on a raised platform. So it isn't really so much what the physical structure looks like on which it takes place, though the safety issues you know, need to be raised, but it's very important that the actual proximity and contact takes place because that's what is biologically appropriate. Um, for example, in terms of the ways this can be misused, bed sharing is often used as kind of a proxy um, for any and all co-sleeping. So in other words, um, somebody might sing, say something like, oh, I heard that co-sleeping is extremely dangerous. Just five babies died last week or last month in Detroit from co-sleeping. And what they are talking about isn't perhaps co-sleeping. They're talking specifically either about sofa sleeping, recliner sleeping, or bed sharing, which can be in many ways either safe or dangerous. Let me explain. Bed sharing may be safe or dangerous, depending on specifically how it's done. I always suggest to parents that a breastfeeding mother-baby pair is much safer in a bed than is in a bottle feeding mother-baby pair because the physiology of breastfeeding um, is very different in both the mother and the baby in terms of sensitivities to the presence of the other. They arouse in relationship to each other. They wake a lot to feed. The baby's placed lower on the arm of the, the mom down to mid-level of her body um, to get to and from the breast. And the baby's always put on its back. The baby doesn't care to move anywhere, somewhere else in the bed. Um, just wants to be, you know, as close to its mother as is possible. So um, co-sleeping needs to be further distinguished. And the question someone might say is, oh, co-sleeping, but what kind of co-sleeping? are you referring to? You know, bed sharing, you know, sofa sleeping and recliner sleeping. Oh, and sofa sleeping and recliner sleeping. Now, there are two forms that are always dangerous. You want to avoid them. But that is a form of co-sleeping, but it's an unsafe variety. So one could always say to somebody, for example, oh, you know, one way in which you can sleep with your baby and it's always safe, one form of co-sleeping, it's called separate surface co-sleeping. Uh, some people like to call it room sharing, <laughs> meaning you're in the same room. But personally, I don't like that term because it um, kind of distances what's really being shared. It's not the inert walls of this room that are being shared and that's protective of babies, and indeed, because room sharing is protective. It's really person sharing. It's the mother or the father who's committed to that baby in the room that's changing something about that baby and making that baby healthier and safer for its night's sleep. It's proactive. So, you know, separate surface co-sleeping or person sharing but on separate surfaces is extremely important and always safe. Well, an important question to ask is why bed sharing? Why sleep with your baby? And in some ways, it's a very critical question to ask. It's one that's really ignored by public health officials that wished it would go away. Well, it's not going to go away because we live in a breastfeeding culture now, and breastfeeding is, in fact, functionally interrelated with sleeping close to baby in one way or another. So the baby's not going to be found down the hall because 
human breast milk is very calorie light. There's not much protein, there's not much fat, lots of sugars, it burns fast, but it's perfect for good brain growth of our human infant brains. But the problem is that babies need to feed about every hour and a half to two hours, and that's what they do. So mothers, even if they don't plan it, they find, oh, hmm, I get more sleep if I have my baby closer and closer. And babies negotiate even further, and they like being next to their moms, and indeed, there you go. Moms like pleasing their babies, babies like getting those sensations of warmth and protectiveness that they're designed to enjoy and respond positively to, and thus you get, in our culture now, bed sharing. What happens when they bed share? Well, babies breastfeed two to three to four times more frequently than if they were sleeping down the hall that boosts their immune systems. While they're bed sharing, they oxygenate, they arouse more frequently. These are all very protective and uh, related differences between a bed sharing baby and a solitary sleeping baby. The arousals that babies exhibit in relationship to their parents, who may have aroused two or three seconds before, leads to an oxygenation. They maintain higher oxygen levels. Um, they simply will as well spend more time in lighter stages of sleep, which is an advantage for babies that are so premature at birth. That is, we're all premature at birth with only 25% of our brain volume. That's who we are. But this requires us to learn how to arouse to protect ourselves from apneas. You don't want a baby that has an arousal deficiency, that has difficulty arousing, being pushed into really artificial, deeper stages of sleep by virtue of sensory isolation from the mother. But that's exactly what happens. Sensory isolation permits babies to sleep long and hard before they're really ready to accommodate it by virtue of having an equal ability to get out of a deep pattern of sleep should they need to, to con conclude or to terminate an apnea, a slight breathing pause. So what we find in the bed sharing situation that has potentially life-saving significance is that babies, one, get a lot of practice arousing, which is the defense mechanism against apneas or oxygen depletion, and or they spend a greater amount of time in the lighter stages of sleep for which they're better designed to um, awake from in order to terminate those apneas. So breastfeeding is increased, oxygenation, body temperature is maintained at a better level that's to the, the immature baby's needs, etc. You find light stage and more arousing. And all of these things reflect the normative biological expected patterns of sleep for our human infants. It's probably important to point out that co-sleeping we know is biologically appropriate and evolved. Now how it's specifically done is the big issue of debate and there's safe ways to do it and there are unsafe ways to do it. But we do know this, that cross-culturally, those cultures for which co-sleeping is the norm and where associated with that is a lack of maternal smoking and a lack of drug use and or alcohol during co-sleeping. Those countries all over the world have, this, have either the lowest SIDS rates on record or the cultures aren't even aware of such a phenomenon of a supposedly healthy infant not waking up. And, dying during the night. It's just completely unknown in Asian and Chinese countries. In Japan, that has the norm of, of co-sleeping, you know, on uh, futons, etc. have, once again, for an industrialized society, the lowest rates um, measurable at all. What that's telling us is it isn't that there's an inherent danger at all to sleeping with your baby on the same surface, but there are ways that we can specifically learn as to how to reduce the risks that could be associated with it. The problem with our own culture at the moment is that all ways to reduce and minimize risks of bed sharing have been extracted from hospital brochures, and parents are not being able to know that this is their right to get that information. I use as an example the requirements related to asking people to participate in your research for a subject consent form, and it is by law necessary to state what the benefits and the risks are of that participation. So all the information has to be disclosed. But medical authorities in our own country, including levels of government organization, county agencies, have decided that parents don't need to know what in fact can reduce risks of bed sharing. They simply should not do it. And I feel that's both unethical 
and that taxpayer money deserves to be put in and used to support what parents need and want. They are the only individuals and the only um, entity that has the right to make a decision about where their baby is going to sleep. This is an inherent civil liberty. It is a right that every baby is born with to have access to its mother's body, and it's a right by every mother and father to decide exactly in a relational context where they want their baby to sleep. It's often influenced very greatly by breastfeeding because breastfeeding is so much easier and so easily managed by mothers in terms of her and the baby getting more sleep um, and her you know, not having to walk down the hall and reset the baby has fed. So one of the difficulties going on in our country is a very negative uh, image and presentation of the bed sharing issue, an oversimplified one is being presented when it's a complex issue. Bed sharing is not a discrete little variable. You know, either do it or you don't and it's all the same and you get the same function and the same outcome. You don't. It depends very specifically on the details of how it's done. For example, a mother that smoked during her pregnancy has injured its baby's brains to arouse. That would not be the baby to be put into a bed sharing environment. We already know that other children in bed is a danger to babies. We know, for example, that putting a baby prone in any sleep environment is dangerous and puts the baby at risk for SIDS. We know that heavy duvets is dangerous. We know that gaps between the headboard and the mattress or having a light table too close and creating gaps into which babies can fall is dangerous and should be removed. We know this. These are adverse factors. These are factors that enormously increase the threats of a baby dying or something deleterious happening to them during the bed sharing. This, these aren't imaginations. These are practical, simple to understand issues that American parents are not being told because someone is making the decision for them that they simply do not need to know. And that is both unethical and inappropriate and we need to be taking our attention or giving our attention to these issues and demanding from our county agencies that this information be revealed and be promoted because it's going to save lives. I have to say that it's been very interesting watching during the last 20 years, participating and watching, and being very proud of how parents are taking the responsibility on themselves to find ways to become empowered. When there is a big event in the news, for example, that seems to take aim and gives a very simple explanation why babies died in a bed-sharing environment, and oh, by the way, what I mean by that is that yes, babies tragically will die in a bed sharing environment, but they will have died because they were sleeping prone in the bed sharing environment. Or a child um, that shouldn't have been in the bed over, overlaid that baby um, in, in bed. And or the mother smoked during a pregnancy. And what we don't usually hear in the news is what the specific factor is associated with the death that actually explains the death, as opposed to just simply the practice, bed sharing because there's an enormous range of differences between what constitutes a safe bed sharing environment and a dangerous safe environment. That kind of information I was alluding to earlier that parents need to know. So we need to conceptualize what parents are going to need in the future and why it's important to change these public health policies we were mentioning. It will not be subject to cultural nullification. As bread, breastfeeding spreads, the absolute connectedness with the baby sleeping with the mother and the way the baby's biology is designed to want to sleep with the mother and the mother designed biologically to want to please the baby who wants to sleep with them, that is not going away. And I do think that it's going to be our responsibility to further promote the empowerment of parents, to remind them that this is only their decision to make, that medical authorities and citizens and civil agents and county officials, they are there to provide all the information that they need to make the best decisions for their families. And so in the future, what my laboratory will be doing is trying to promote um, information to parents that gives them the confidence to be able to stand up when county officials make very vitriolic and inappropriate comments about the irresponsibility of parents who bed share. And I see that tide turning. When I see a big event on the news and you look uh, at the comments made following an article on the internet, 
I just sit back and I go, wow, parents have really learned a lot. They know what the scientific counterpoint is to the coroner getting up and saying, five new babies died last week in Wisconsin. And what the parents will say is, well, tell me, that's very fine, but I want to know, was the baby sleeping prone? Did the mother smoke? Were there other children in the bed? Because that's what's explaining the death. And that's a very important sign that the parents are becoming informed and being convinced that it's only their choice to make. I like to, to remind parents that the only power some of these people have over us is what we choose to give them. And it's very important for them to know that they retain that liberty and that opportunity and privilege to make those decisions for their children. There's one interesting new bit of news coming out of the lab. We just published a paper in Social Science and Medicine, and we documented four very specific cases of mothers, different levels of the socioeconomic spectrum, who all compromise and take risks, but yet very carefully gauge the likelihood of the risks that they do take will really seriously injure their babies. No environment necessarily can always be perfect, and it can't because the resources that women have are unequal, both in terms of education and material resources. But they will always do the best that they can, and there will always be trade-offs, and there will always be some risks that we take. And the important thing is to realize that you will always have women and fathers in these situations. And insofar as you're able to give them all the more information, the kinds of risks that they're willing to take will be more educated ones. And in fact, they will be the ones that will be much less significant to the health of their child. So what we tried to do in this paper is listen to what parents tell us about why even knowing something could be potentially dangerous, why is it that they might take that risk? And what we find is that they very diligently and very systematically structure the levels of risk they perceive, but they do it based on the amount of information they have. And when they have the information, they know where the risks are too great and should not be overcome, like if you smoke during your pregnancy or if you're drunk or desensitized by drugs. But you would be shocked at what parents sometimes do not specifically know. But in part, I'm not surprised because so much information is being held back that should otherwise be open and widely disseminated in our population. And what our lab tries to do is keep parents up to date through our website of www.cosleeping.nd.edu. It's a completely non-commercial site. We don't get any money from that site. It's all information. It dispenses articles for free. And PowerPoints and guidelines and what every professional should know, very simple material. Um, and so its, its purpose is only to create opportunities for parents to learn and professionals to learn and the media to learn and to create a better health environment for mothers and babies.